Hello, this is Cecilia with Kentucky Rose Devotionals, and we're finishing out the book of Luke, chapter 23 today. we got one chapter left, so I may try to squeeze one in over the weekend so that we can start with something brand new on Monday. So I hope that the book of Luke has encouraged you getting the, the look, the eyes of a physician, um, and his point of view on all the things that he was told um, by Peter, um, by Paul um, and the different apostles and, and to be told these things through the Holy Spirit. So um, this inspired word from him to get his, his viewpoint I think is really, really interesting. And I love this this chapter. I love um, that Jesus is laid down his life for our sins and where would we be without the Lord? Where would we be with, with what he if he hadn't went to that cross, we, we would have no hope today. But we are so thankful for that. I love the, where we left off last time where uh, Jesus prayed that Peter's faith not fail. And I want to remind you again of that because it's such a powerful word to us all is that Jesus was praying for all of us that night in Gethsemane. He was praying that none of us would fail, that we would all be faithful unto him. And so I hope that we will, I, I know with God's help, we will achieve that. Um, goal that he has for all of us um, to reach heaven. But it says um, at verse 1 that the whole multitude of chapter 23 um, it, it arose and it, it led him to Pilate and they began to accuse him saying we have found this fellow perverting the nations and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar saying that he himself is Christ and is king. And again all these accusations that they brought against Christ they brought all kinds of witnesses and none of their stories added up none of it none of it was true but yet um, they they got their their requests here because it was Jesus appointed time and so Pilate asked and said are you the king of the Jews and he answered it is as you say and Pilate the chief priest in the crowd he told them he said I find no fault in this man and they were even more fierce stirring up the people, teaching throughout Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. This is that Pilate had heard, of, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the men were Galilean, and as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. And he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and, and accused him. And Herod with the men of war treated him with contempt, and they mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. But for some reason, I can probably tell you why, for, for a satanic reason, the two of them came together um, as friends after this. And Pilate um, called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. And he said, You brought this man to me who misleads the people. I have examined him in your presence. I have found no fault concerning him of which you accused him. He couldn't find anything that they had accused him of that he had done. And he sent him to Herod. And indeed, even Herod said he deserved, didn't deserve death. There had been nothing done by him. He said, therefore, I will chastise him and release him. Pilate's intention was to let Jesus go. He knew Jesus was innocent. And his wife had even come to him and warned him, please, you know, I've had bad dreams about this man. You don't need to have anything to do with this. You need to leave this alone. This man is innocent. And so he knew he wanted to, to rid his hands of it. And they cried out all the more. You know, he was hoping they would release Jesus. Um, but instead, they chose a murderer over the Son of God. And it says, they cried out at once, away with this man, released to us Barabbas. And so, um, he had been in prison for a rebellion in the city and for murder. And Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, cried out to them again and said, please. And they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. The same ones who had, had said Hosanna in the highest, you know, when he was coming through Jerusalem a week earlier, praising him, thanking God for him, now were the same ones who the Pharisees had stirred up the crowd and they were crying out, now crucify him, crucify him. And he said the third time, what evil has he done? I find no reason of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. He was telling the people, I'm going to let him go. 
no matter what you say. But the people insisted, and they demanded with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voice of these men and the chief priests prevailed. You know, isn't it something that we allow people in high places or people with more voices, the people that are rising up, to have the last word instead of standing up for what we know is right. And Pilate gave that sentence as it should be that they requested. And he released to them the one they requested. He released Barabbas, the one who was a murderer, and threw him into prison but delivered Jesus to their will. So there he was. Now led away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simus of Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that they might bear it after Jesus. The cross wasn't Jesus's to bear. Wasn't Jesus cross to bear at all. He didn't sin. He never committed any sin. So it was not his to bear. So it was only right that someone else should bear that cross. That he that he would not have to walk that cross to Calvary. But he died on it, didn't he? The great multitudes followed him. The women mourned and lamented for him. And it's funny that here all these people had followed him. And at the end, the only people that were there that were his apostles were women. Only the women were there standing by and John. That was the only apostle that stood by and watched as Jesus was crucified that went with him all the way to the cross. And I believe Jesus rewarded him for that because he was one out of the eleven. He was the only one that did not die a horrible death, either crucifixion, beheading, stabbing. He, he didn't die that way. He died of old age. <laughs> so I think God rewarded him for that, for being faithful to the end. And Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. For they will begin to say to the mountain, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if we do these things in the green wood, what will they be done in the dry? And there were two criminals, one on each side of Jesus. They were there to be put to death, and they come to the place called Calvary, or place Golgotha, the place of the skull, where they crucified him, the criminal, one on the right hand and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The very ones that were crucifying Jesus, he was forgiving them and asking for forgiveness for them. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and they stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. He, if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. Again, still mocking him. And the soldiers mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. And the inscription was written over him in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him and said, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other one answered and rebuked, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then Jesus said, he said to Jesus, he looked at Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What was that statement? He made a statement of faith. He said, you know, I deserve what I got. I, I deserve the justice that I got. I committed a crime. I did wrong. But this man that I see beside me, he's done no wrong. He was innocent, you know, and he truly recognized who Jesus was, that Jesus was the Son of God. And so... He got it. He got in there right at the end, didn't he? You know, he he was on his he was literally on his deathbed there on that cross. But he said, "Lord, remember me when you get into your kingdom." That was all it took. And what did Jesus say? He said, "Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise." When that criminal took his last breath and shut his eyes and he opened his eyes up again he was in a new place he was in a new world he was in a new place like he'd never seen before he was in heaven with Jesus the one that had died for him died beside him had given him life to live eternally praise the Lord 
and that was about the sixth hour and there was darkness until the ninth hour all these things were were prophecies being fulfilled the sun was dark and the veil was torn in two from the top to the bottom what did that signify it signified the fact that no more did anybody have to shed blood for remission of sins Jesus did it one time once and for all it was it was enough the blood of Jesus is enough for us no matter what we're facing no matter what we're going through no matter what sin you've committed there is no sin too big that cannot fit under that blood that Jesus shed on the cross for our sins praise God for that he cried out with a loud voice and he said father into your hands I commend my spirit and having said that he breathed his last and when the centurion saw what had happened he glorified God saying certainly this was a righteous man truly I like what the King James says truly this was the son of God even the Roman centurion soldier knew who Jesus was by all the things that it took place the earthquake the Sun not being shining all these things that took place the words that he spoke even from the cross he was changing lives from the last words that he said the whole crowd came together at that site seeing what they had done and they beat their breasts and returned but all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things and you know how heartbreaking this had to be for all those that love Jesus to see him die and death seems so final doesn't it you know when we look at it we, we think you know it's so final but Jesus had already promised and what he promises he keeps and so we see Joseph, a council member of the Sanhedrin, but he was a good and just man who had accepted Jesus. He had not consented to the decision that the council had made. He was from Arimathea, the city of the Jews, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God, it says. I love that. You know, he was set apart. He was different. He was looking at things through different eyes. He was waiting for the kingdom of God, and he knew it had come. He had seen Jesus come. He'd seen the kingdom of heaven come to earth. And he went to Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in the tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had laid before. No one had been in that tomb before except Jesus. And it was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath drew near, so they had to move quickly. The women who had come from Galilee followed after him, and they observed the tomb and how the bo his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the command. So here we go. It's the Sabbath day. And we know three days later, we know what's going to take place, and it's exciting. But, but we see here, you know, they stood at a distance. And I believe there's a lot of people today who are doing that. They stand at a distance to see who is this Jesus? Who really is he? Was he everything that people said he was? Is he? Is he, is he real? You know, you may be going through a situation where you're doubting and questioning and asking God, God, are you there? Are you real? You may be like these others that were standing at a distance, wanting to believe, but yet afraid to believe. And so, you know, I just have to look to this. I have to look to the, the one at the cross. The two that had a decision. Both made two very different decisions. One chose to mock God and not believe. And the other chose to love God and believe his promises were true. And one woke up in paradise and the other, well, we won't say where he woke up, but I'm pretty sure we all know. You know, so we look at this and we say, you know, what 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 do, what does this tell us today that we need to do for ourselves and in our life it means that we need to stand on the promises of God no matter what no matter if we see the answer no matter if we 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 understand everything that we're going through we continue to believe and we continue to hope and we continue to trust in God so I want to pray with you Lord we ask that you just be with us that you would give us the faith to believe God even in the face of the impossible that we would continue to believe you to trust you to honor you with our life to honor you with our words God that we would live out what you have called us to live out every single day and in Jesus name we pray and I will see you next time